Preface of Stories of Starland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seville. Stories of Starland by Mary Proctor. Preface The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalms Preface This book has been a labor of love from the beginning to the end, and I have thoroughly enjoyed conversing with my little friends Harry and Nellie. Now that the book is finished, I leave it with regret. It is impossible to give all the authorities for my legends of the stars. Many were told to me by my father when I was a little girl, or I found them among books in his library which is now scattered far and wide others are from grecian mythology japanese folklore hindu legends while some of the american indian stories were found in musty volumes of the bureau of ethnology at the smithsonian institution as for the descriptive astronomy among my authorities are professor c a young professor bernard Agnes M. Clark, Professor R. S. Ball, Scriaparelli, Flammarion, Professor Todd, Mr. Lowell of Flagstaff, Arizona, and my father, the late Richard A. Proctor. With the kind permission of Houghton, Mifflin, and Company, I have been allowed to use the following selections. Why the Stars Twinkle by Oliver Wendell Holmes, The Evening Star by Longfellow, Lady Moon by Lord Houghton, and The New Moon by Mrs. Fallon. The editor of St. Nicholas has kindly given me permission to include the poem The Four Sunbeams by M. K. B., Estelle's Astronomy by Delia Hart Stone, and Seven Little Indian Stars by Mrs. S. M. B. Piat. I am indebted to the editor of Child Study Monthly for The Little Poem, Is It True?, by Morgan Groth. The poem on the solar system is taken from the youth's companion, with the kind permission of the editor. The verses about Winkin, Blinken, and Nod are so familiar to every child that my book of Stories of Starland would seem incomplete without this poem by Eugene Field. The illustration of a part of the Milky Way is from a photograph taken by Professor Bernard at the Lick Observatory. Mr. Percival Lowell has also very kindly allowed me to make use of his excellent illustration of the canals of Mars, taken from Todd's New Astronomy, published by the American Book Company. I now submit this little book to my young readers, sincerely hoping its pages may inspire them with a renewed interest in the wonders of Starland. Mary Proctor, New York City, June 1898 End Preface Chapter One of Stories of Starland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seville. Stories of Starland by Mary Proctor. Chapter One The Story of Giant Sun. Light by F. W. Burdelin. Night has a thousand eyes, and the day but one, yet the light of the bright world dies with the dying sun. The mind has a thousand eyes, and the heart but one, yet the light of the whole life dies when love is done. The Story of Giant Sun Sister, come here and talk to me. I am so tired of being alone. His sister Mary at once closed her book and took a chair beside Harry's couch. Poor little Harry was not like other boys. He could not play and run about as they did, for he was a cripple. All the long weary days he had to lie on a couch, which was placed under the shady trees during the warm summer season. He had learned to love the flowers and trees 
and the bright blue sky overhead, and his sister often told him pretty stories about them. She was just thinking of telling him one now, when he said gently, Ancient Stories of the Sun Sister, you had told me so many stories of the flowers. I wish you would tell me something about the sky. I have been looking at it for such a long time, watching the little white clouds floating across it like boats with silver sails, and then I try to look at the bright yellow sun, but it dazzles my eyes. Won't you tell me about it, and where it goes in the evening, when we cannot see it any more? Is it always ready in the morning to give us light? Is it ever late, do you think? What would we do if it forgot to come around the edge of the earth and give us light? He continued anxiously. Earth supposed to be flat. There is no fear of that, said his sister Mary, laughing at the idea. But a long time ago, people asked the very same question. In those days, they thought the earth was flat, and surrounded by an ocean without end. The Hindu supposed that the earth rested upon four elephants, and the four elephants stood on the back of an immense tortoise, which itself floated on the surface of an endless ocean. It was thought that the sun plunged into the ocean when it disappeared in the evening, and some people said they heard a hissing noise when the red-hot body went under the waves. But if the sun dropped into the water each evening, how did it happen that next morning it was seen again as hot and bright as ever? The people could not tell why, so they said that during the night the gods made a new sun to be used the next day. That must have kept them busy, said Harry, laughing. Ancient Idea of the Earth The good people made up another story about the sun, so that the same one could be saved each night. Just as it was dropping into the ocean, a god named Vulcan, who had a great boat ready, caught it, and all night long he paddled with the blazing sun. Next morning he was ready at sunrise to send the sun up into the sky in the east. He threw it with so much force that it would go very high, and when it came down on the other side in the west, he stood ready to catch it again. But where does the sun really go at night? asked Harry, curiously. I should like to know. Heat of the Sun Illustrating Day and Night We live on a big round globe called Earth, replied his sister, and we travel round the sun, which gives the earth light and heat. The sun is like a great lamp in the sky and when you face the lamp you see light, but if you turn away from it, you are in darkness. As the earth goes round the sun, it whirls around like a huge top. First one side, and then the other is turned to the sun and gets sunlight, and so we have day and night. If the sun, or the lamp in the sky, went out and stopped shining, all the light would go out on the earth, and we would miss its heat as well. So it is so hot that if it kept coming nearer and nearer, until it was as far from the earth as the pretty bright moon, the earth would get warmer and warmer and melt like a ball of wax. Just like Nellie's doll, then, said Harry. When she left it on the grass the other day, the sun was so hot that day that when Nellie picked up her doll, she found that its wax face had melted and the eyes had fallen in. So the sun did that, continued Harry, laughing heartily. Poor Nelly, I must tell her that the next time I see her. I can show you something else to prove how hot the sun is, said Mary, as she picked up a leaf from the ground. Just wait a moment while I go into the house and get a magnifying glass. In a few minutes she returned, holding the glass in one hand and the leaf in the other. She held it so that the sun shone directly upon the glass and passed through it onto the leaf. In a few seconds the leaf began to smoke and then burn, until a little hole could be seen. 
Harry was so surprised that he had to try it for himself, and he looked forward with much delight to a visit from his cousin Nellie. "'Won't I have a lot to tell her?' he said to his sister. "'All about the sun's melting her dolly, and how to make the sun burn a hole through a leaf. But the sun cannot be very far away, can it?' he asked. Distance of the Sun "'Yes, it is very far away,' replied Mary. "'If a railroad could be made from the earth to the sun, "'and a train started going at the rate of a mile a minute, "'it would take days and weeks and years to get there.' "'Let me see,' said Mary, making a little note in her notebook. "'There are sixty minutes in an hour, and twenty-four hours in a day, "'and three hundred and sixty-five days in a year.' Why, Harry, do you think it would take that train nearly one hundred and seventy-five years to get there? It must be very far away, then, said Harry. More than a hundred miles. It is more than a million miles, said Mary. It is nearly ninety-three million of miles away. Now, let us suppose you want to go to the sun. You would call at the railroad office and ask for a ticket to Sunland. The officer in charge would appear a little surprised, because that is quite a long trip. Then he would look up the cost of the journey in his book, and hand you a mileage book, saying, Sir, if you want to save money on this trip, you had better take a mileage book with you, costing two cents for every mile. Even then your fare will be nearly two million dollars. Then I would say, Dear sir, I cannot go, as I know my sister could not spare all that money. I think I would rather walk to the sun. How long would it take me to walk there, supposing I could walk? asked Harry thoughtfully. Dear, you would have to keep walking a very long time before you would ever get there. Supposing you walked four miles an hour and ten hours a day, and kept this up for hundreds of years, you would be more than six thousand years on the way. When you reach the sun, you would be footsore and weary, and as old as the hills. Harry laughed heartily at the idea, and thought again of poor Nellie's doll and the melting wax running like tears down its cheeks. But suppose, he asked, his eyes bright with excitement, someone fired a big cannon at the sun. Would the cannon-ball ever get there? Again, Mary brought out her little notebook, and with rather a look of surprise, she said, Supposing the cannon-ball went as fast as it could go, it would take nine years to reach the sun, and the sound of the explosion would reach there in fourteen years. The cannon-ball would come along first, and five years afterward, if you were living on the sun, you would hear the sound made when the cannon was fired off. It takes time for me to walk from the garden to the house. So it takes time for sound to travel from the earth to the sky. And sound travels only one-fifth of a mile in a second. Do you remember the thunderstorm the other day, Harry, that frightened you so? I shall never forget it, said Harry, trembling at the thought. You said count slowly, and I counted one, two, three, four, five, up to fifteen. Then I said, Don't be afraid, brother. The storm is three miles away. Yes, I remember, said Harry, and I thought you were very clever, and wondered how you knew. It was not so wonderful after all, was it? said Mary, laughing. Now tell me, sister, said Harry, supposing I had a very long arm and stretched it out toward the sun, and touched it with the tip of my little finger, what would happen? You would never know that you had burned it, for the pain of burning would be one hundred and fifty years going along your little finger, and down your giant arm nearly ninety-three million of miles long, before it at last reached your brain. Then it would let you know that one hundred and fifty years before you had burned your little finger. Harry stretched out his little arm in the direction of the sun, and looking at it critically, laughed at the idea of a giant arm millions of miles long. 
it is too short by several inches said his sister reading his thoughts and joining in the laugh it would take hundreds and hundreds of little arms as long as yours would it not now what else do you want to know about the sun size of the sun if you are not very tired sister said harry coaxingly i should like to know how large it is is it as large as the earth ever so much larger replied mary it is so large that if it were cut up into a million parts each part would be larger than the earth if we could weigh the sun in a pair of giant scales it would take over three hundred thousand globes as heavy as the earth to make the scales even if the sun were hollowed out and the earth placed in the centre there would be room for the moon as well now the moon is thousands of miles from the earth and yet the edge of the sun would be thousands of miles from the moon as you will see in the picture if a tunnel could be made through the centre of the sun and a train started going at the rate of a mile a minute it would take six hundred days for the train to reach the other side of the tunnel if this same train went around the edge of the sun it would take five years a train going around the earth would take seventeen days to complete the journey but suppose we went around the sun in a big steamer like the one uncle robert came over in how long would that take asked harry curiously only fifteen years said his sister laughing if you had started when you were a little baby you would still have five more years to travel before you would get back again to the starting point then the sun must be very large said harry thoughtfully let us call it giant sun has it always been as large as it is now the sun in the days of its youth ever so much larger replied mary once upon a time it was a ball of glowing gas reaching as far as the path of the last planet the ball whirled around rapidly and the outer edge cooled a ring formed and separated from the ball and whirled around on its own account until it broke up into fragments one of the fragments drew all the others toward it and another ball was formed but quite a small ball this time called a planet just like the center ball the planet kept whirling around threw off a ring the ring broke up into little pieces and the pieces coming together made a little moon the planet is neptune and it still has only one moon meanwhile the ball in the center kept whirling around other rings formed other planets with their attendant moons completing the family of giant sun the sun is in the center and his planets circle around him next to him is playful little mercury then beautiful venus then our own planet earth beyond it we find ruddy mars the four hundred and fifty baby planets giant planet jupiter the ringed planet saturn and the last two planets uranus and neptune all these planets are under the control of the sun and cannot get away from him what is the sun made of asked harry of iron and copper and silver and many other things we can find on earth but the sun is so hot that they are melted together into a mass like glue this is the center of the sun outside is a shell of bright clouds from which rosy flames leap to a height of thousands of miles above the surface of the sun all around the edge of the sun and reaching millions of miles beyond it is the pearly light of the corona like a crown of glory the pearly corona fades away into a soft beam of light how beautiful the sun must be said harry as he listened attentively to his sister but is it all alone in the sky and does it not have any little stars to play with it is not all lonely said mary laughing at the idea of stars as playthings for giant sun and is kept quite busy looking after its large family of planets 
I will tell you about them tomorrow, or nurse will scold me for tiring you. And now, good-bye, my dear. Don't forget all I have told you about Giant Sun. Forget? How could I, sister? It is better than any fairy tale I have ever heard. Giant Sun, why, you have told me enough to keep me thinking all day and all night. Here comes Nellie. Hello! Nellie, come here and let me tell you all about Giant Sun, and how he melted your dolly for you the other day. Melted my dolly? said a pretty little golden-haired girl, as she tripped like a little fairy up the garden path. So he melted my dolly, did he? I should like to see him do it again. Tears came into her eyes at the thought of her sad experience. Since then, however, a china head had replaced the melted wax, and Nellie's fickle little heart had been comforted. So the tears soon vanished in a smile as she showed her new treasure to Harry. Poems for the Story of Giant Sun On the Setting Sun by Sir Walter Scott Those evening clouds, that setting ray, and beauteous tint serve to display their great creator's praise. Then let the short-lived thing called man, whose life comprised within a span, to him his homage raise. We often praise the evening clouds, and tints so gay and behold, but seldom think upon our God, who tinged these clouds with gold. The Four Sunbeams by M. K. B. Four little sunbeams came earthward one day, shining and dancing along on their way, resolved that their course should be blessed. Let us try, they all whispered, some kindness to do, not seek our own pleasuring all the day through, then meet in the eve at the west. One sunbeam ran in at a low cottage door, and played hide-and-seek with a child on the floor till baby laughed loud in his glee and chased with delight his strange playmate so bright the little hands grasping in vain for the light that ever before them would flee one crept to the couch where an invalid lay and brought him a dream of sweet summer day its bird song and beauty and bloom till pain was forgotten and weary unrest and in fancy he roamed through the scenes he loved best, far away from the dim, darkened room. One stole to the heart of a flower that was sad, and loved and caressed her until she was glad, and lifted her white face again, for love brings content to the lowliest lot, and finds something sweet in the dreariest spot, and lightens all labor and pain. And one where a little blind girl sat alone, not sharing the mirth of her playfellows shone, on hands that were folded and pale, and kissed the poor eyes that had never known sight, that never would gaze on the beautiful light, till angels had lifted the veil. At last, when the shadows of evening were falling, and the sun, the great father, his children was calling, Four sunbeams sped into the west. All said, We have found that in seeking the pleasure of others we fill to the full of our own measure. Then softly they sank to their rest. By St. Nichols, December, 1879 The Sun by Anonymous Somewhere it is always light, for when tis morning here, in some far distant land tis night, and the bright moon shines there. When you've retired and gone to sleep, they are just rising there, and morning o'er the hill doth creep, when it is evening here, and other distant lands there be, where it is always night. For weeks the sun may never see, the stars alone give light. But though tis dark both night or day, it is as wondrous quite, that when the night has passed away, 
the sun for weeks gives light yes while you sleep the sun shines bright the sky is blue and clear for weeks and weeks there is no night but always daylight there end of chapter one section two of stories of starland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. stories of starland by mary proctor the family of the giant sun the next morning when mary came out in the garden to sit with harry she was surprised to see an audience of three instead of one harry whose face beamed with delight when he saw her nelly who was seated in a tiny rocking chair beside him and nelly's doll you see dolly wants to know all about the giant's son too nelly gravely informed mary i never could remember all and she might remember what i forget besides she must learn some day that is what mamma said about me i heard her nelly continued wisely as she looked up at mary do you mind telling me about the sky people too mind why you little bit of a doll baby laughed mary as she picked her up doll and all and hugged her if you and dolly promise not to go to sleep you can stay here as long as you want to but does aunt agnes know you are here nelly or have you run away from home no i have not run away said nelly earnestly but my dolly has nurse brought me over here but she did not know my dolly was here i forgot all about her yesterday while harry was telling me about giant's son and i left her out on the grass but she didn't melt a bit. I knew you wouldn't, dear little Dolly, would you? Now, Dolly, sit up straight and listen to Cousin Mary talk. My, how she can talk, too, can't you? I'll try, said Mary, laughing. So you want to hear about Giant Sun and his family? He has such a large family, and he has to give them all plenty of light and heat. If he put out his big lamp in the sky, it would always be dark here, and we would shiver with cold and die. When I come to your room at night, Harry, to say good night, I always carry a lamp in my hand so that I can see you. But supposing a puff of wind blew it out, then I could not see you at all. Now this light is not only for us, but for the rest of the sun's family as well. First, there is little Mercury, who is named after the god of thieves. And he deserves this name because he steals more light and heat from the sun than any of the other planets. What is a planet? asked Harry. A planet is just like this earth we are living on, and only shines with the light it burrows from the sun. If we lived on planet Mercury and could look at our earth, we would see it shining like a bright star in the sky. But all the light comes from the sun. Do we live on a star, then? asked Nelly, her little eyes wide open with amazement. No, we live on a planet. We could not live on a star, as a star is blazing hot. That is the difference between a star and a planet. A star is hot and bright and shining and gives light to the planets, if it has any. Planets are little globes like the Earth that circle around the sun. Then the sun must be a star, said Harry, as you told me yesterday that it is very hot. That is right, said Mary, and every star in the sky is a sun. And has lots of weensy teensy planets going all around it, asked Nelly excitedly story of planet mercury some of them have i am sure said mary but now we are running along too fast and i must tell you about our own sun first and its nearest planet mercury well mercury is a very warm little world and it gets so near the sun that sometimes it is about nine times as warm as here and at other times it is only four times as warm you see mercury does not go round the sun in a perfect circle so at times it is farther away than at others. Now the sun is like a great fire in the sky, and the nearer we go to it, the warmer we are. How would you like to live on a little world where it is nine times warmer than it is here? I should not like it at all, would you, Dolly? said Nelly. We would roast if we went to World Mercury. But we don't know whether there are any people there, continued Mary. And if there are, they might not mind the heat at all. You can get used to the heat, just as Uncle Robert did when he went to India. Don't you remember how he felt the change when he came home, and how he shivered? 
He missed the heat just as we would suffer from it if we went to India for the first time." "Then Uncle Robert would not mind going to Mercury," said Harry, laughing, "if he is getting to like the heat in India. But I do not want him to go yet, as he might never come back again, and what would we do without him?" "What would we?" said Nellie mournfully, her eyes filling with tears at the very thought. "Is a planet made of earth and stones and trees and flowers, just like planet Earth?" asked Harry. "'Yes, dear,' replied his sister. "'Only some planets, like Jupiter and Saturn, "'are still wrapped up in a blanket of clouds and steam, "'and we cannot see them yet. "'They are very hot indeed, "'and all the water that will make the oceans and seas and bays "'is now steam and clouds hiding the true planet from view. "'Water could no more rest on the surface of the planets Jupiter and Saturn "'than it could rest on red-hot iron.' Don't you remember the other day, when Nurse upset a cup of water on the hot stove, how the water sizzled and turned into steam in a moment? Now, planet Earth, a long time ago, when it was a very young world, was very hot, like Jupiter. All the lakes and seas and oceans were turned into steam and blankets of cloud. It would have been a very uncomfortable world to live on then. But it became cooler and cooler and the clouds changed into the oceans and seas and lakes that make our earth so beautiful. Some day this little world will grow old, and the oceans will get smaller and smaller, and the earth colder and colder. Then there will be scarcely any air to breathe, and we would gasp and die just like that poor fish that Uncle Robert caught last week and threw in the bottom of the boat. Don't you remember, Nelly, how the poor little thing gasped and jumped around? It could not live out of the water, so it died. Now we cannot live without air, and if this earth had not any air we would die. But this will not happen for a very long time. Are you quite sure? asked Harry, with an anxious look on his face. Because I don't want to die yet, sister. Quite sure, my little brother, she said, kissing him tenderly. For hundreds and hundreds of years must pass away before anyone will have any idea that the earth is growing old. "'And what will become of the poor little fishes when the oceans dry up?' asked Nelly sadly, as she clasped her dolly closely in her arms, as though to protect it from the coming trouble. "'I expect they will all die,' said Harry wisely, "'because you know, Nelly, they can't live out of water, can they?' "'Or else that fish Uncle Robert caught would have lived,' said Nelly. "'But please, tell us a story about Mercury, Cousin Mary, and the other little planets.' Well, Mercury is a very little planet, and instead of taking a year of 365 days, it goes around the sun in 88 days. That is, it goes round the sun four times, while we go round it only once. Some think Mercury always keeps the same side turned to the sun, so that it is always day on one side and night on the other, but we are not quite sure about this yet. I should like to live on Mercury, wouldn't you, Harry? said Nellie, clapping her hands with glee. Just think of day all the time, and never having to go to sleep. But you would get very tired of that, said Mary, and long for the night to come. And besides, would you not miss seeing the moon and the beautiful stars? I would live on the edge of Mercury, said Harry thoughtfully, so that when I was tired of day, I might slip around it and have night. It must be very cold on the other side, where the sun does not shine, if Mercury gets all its heat from the sun. I suspect it is, said Mary, and I don't believe we should like to live on Mercury after all. So let us try the next planet, which is called Venus. Story of Planet Venus What a pretty name, said Nellie, and is Venus very warm like Mercury? It is not so near to the sun, replied Mary, but it is about twice as warm and bright as our planet. Venus is nearly as large as the Earth, and sometimes she is called her twin sister. Like Mercury, she may probably always turn the same face to the sun and get baked on one side and frozen on the other. She looks like a beautiful silver globe in the sky. Sometimes we see her early in the morning as a morning star, or just about twilight as an evening star. Like Mercury and the Earth, she borrows all her light from the sun. We only see her because the sun is shining on her. Next to Venus is our own planet, Earth, and around it circles the moon. But I must tell you about that another time. Estelle's Astronomy by Delia Hartstone Our little Estelle was perplexed when she found that this wonderful world that we live on is round. How does hell in its place, in its orbit so true, 
was a puzzle to her, with no answer in view. It must be, said Stell, like a ball in the air that is hung by a string, but the string isn't there. St. Nicholas, March, 1896 Venus, fairest of stars, last in the train of night, it better thou belong not to the dawn, sure pledge of day, that crown is in the smiling morn, why thy bright circlet. Milton The Evening Star Lo, in the painted aureole of the west, whose pains the sunken sun incarnadines, like a fair lady at her casement shines, the evening star, the star of love and rest. And then anon she doth herself divest, of all her radiant garments and reclines, behind the sombre screen of yonder pines, with slumber and soft dreams of love oppressed. O oh, my beloved, my sweet Hesperus, my morning and my evening star of love, my best and gentlest lady, even thus, as that fair planet in the sky above, dost thou retire unto thy rest at night, and from thy darkened window fades the light. Longfellow Mercury First, Mercury, amid full tides of light, rolls next the sun through his small circle bright, our earth would blaze beneath so fierce a ray, and all its marble mountains melt away. Fair Venus next fulfills her larger round, with softer beams and milder glory crowned. Friend to mankind, she glitters from afar, now the bright evening, now the morning star. Baker End of section 2「Stories of Starland」by Mary Proctor A Ramble on the Moon The moon was shining brightly and flooding Harry's room with its rays. He was suffering so very much and had tried in vain to sleep. Presently he asked his nurse if she would not let Mary come and talk to him. It will not tire me, he begged earnestly. It does tire me to lie here hour after hour with no one to talk to. His nurse understood him so well, and her heart ached for the lonely child who had so little to amuse him in life. She never refused a request if it were at all possible to grant it. So she called his sister Mary, who hastened at once to his room, and brother and sister were soon far away on a ramble in Starland. We shall go to the moon this evening, she began, and find out what a queer old world it is. Old? asked Harry. Why do you call it old when it looks so bright and new? See, sister, how it seems to be looking right into the window and watching us. I wonder if it knows what we're saying about it. Now what would it think if it heard you calling it old? But it is, said Mary, laughing. And very old indeed. Its face is wrinkled and scarred, and it's just like that of the old dried-up apple we found in the orchard the other day. "'What makes it so bright, then, if it is so old?' asked Harry, as he looked curiously at the moon. "'It borrows its light from the sun,' replied his sister. "'If the sun were to stop shining, you would not be able to see the moon at all. It would be as dark as night and twice as gloomy.' "'Do you think there are people on the moon?' asked Harry excitedly. No, dear, not even the man in the moon, though I am going to tell you some stories about him presently. Besides, no one could live on the moon, as there is not any air to breathe, and you cannot live without air. There is not any water to drink. In fact, there is not a drop of water on the moon. Then it must be very old, said Harry thoughtfully, because you know you told me, sister, some time ago, that if a planet grows very old, all the oceans and bays disappear. Yes, the moon is very old. It is a dead world. If you could go there, you would find it a very gloomy spot. There are no trees or flowers, and there is not even a blade of grass. The sky is always black, and the stars shine night and day. The shadows are so black on the moon that it would be a fine place to play hide-and-seek. The moment you stepped into a shadow, you would become invisible. Just like the prince in the fairy tale who put on a little cap and no one could see him, said Harry. Yes, that prince would not need the cap on the moon. If he did not want anyone to know he was there, all he would have to do would be to keep in the shadow. No one would hear his footsteps, as not a sound can be heard on the moon. 
it would be useless to speak, as there is no air to carry the sound of a voice. I should not like to go to the moon then, said Harry seriously, because you could not tell me any story, sister, could you? And what would I do then? I really cannot imagine, said Mary, laughing. But perhaps you might come across the man in the moon and talk to him in sign language. Like the deaf and dumb people, asked Harry. If he could understand it, said Mary. But then we know there is really not any man in the moon. But there's a story about him, said Harry coaxingly. And I do wish you would tell it to me, just now while the moon is looking at us from the sky. Well, once upon a time, began Mary, in true fairy story fashion, there was a man who went out into the woods and picked up sticks on a Sunday. That was very wicked of him, you know, because Sunday is a day of rest, and picking up sticks is work. He tied the sticks together into a bundle, and putting them on his shoulder, started to walk home with them. On the way, he met a handsome stranger who said to him, What are you picking up sticks for on a Sunday? It does not matter to me whether it is Sunday or Monday, replied the man roughly. I pick up sticks when I want to. Very well, then, replied the handsome stranger sternly. Since you will not observe Sunday as a day of rest on earth, you shall have an everlasting moon day in heaven. Next moment he went whirling away to the sky and landed on the moon, where you can still see him with his load of sticks on his back at full moon. Can I see him now, sister? asked Harry. Not tonight, she replied, because there is only a quarter moon. But perhaps you can see the face of the woman in the moon if you look very carefully. See her sharp chin and pointed nose and shaggy eyebrows. Why, is there a woman in the moon too? asked Harry as he looked intently at the moon, trying to see all his sister had pointed out but having to rely largely upon his imagination. I have heard a story of an old woman who was sent to the moon. Why, what has she done? asked Harry. She was very unhappy while on earth, because she could not tell when the world would come to an end. That is, when it would get old and dead like the moon, so that no one could live on it any longer. For this she was sent to the moon. She has been weaving a forehead strap ever since. Once a month, she stirs a kettle of boiling hominy, and her cat sits beside her unraveling her net. So she keeps on weaving and weaving, and the cat unravels her work as soon as it is done. This must continue to the end of time, for never till then will her work be finished. Poor old woman, said Harry. I wonder she does not hide her work from her cat, or send the cat away. But then, that is only a story. Can you tell me another? Do you never tire of stories? asked Mary, smiling. Never, when you tell them to me, sister. And you seem to know such a lot of them. But these stories are only fairy tales, said Mary, laughing. These moon stories, I mean. I don't mind, said Harry roguishly. We must have a little make-up story now and then, or I would get tired. Do you make them all up yourself, sister? No, indeed, said Mary. I find them here and there and everywhere, sometimes right in the middle of a big book on astronomy, or in the corner of an old newspaper, or hidden away in a book covered with dust on the top shelf in the library. Where did you find that story about the old woman and the cat? In a book of Indian legends, and the story is told by Iroquois Indians. Here is another one I found. Would you like to hear it? You know I would, dear said Harry, nestling closer to his sister as she clasped his hand in hers. THE TOAD IN THE MOON Once upon a time, a little wolf fell very much in love with a toad, and went a-wooing one night. Just like the frog, he would a-wooing go. You remember, Harry, don't you? Whether his mother would let him or no, continued Harry. Of course I remember all about him. So the wolf went after the toad and... He prayed that the moon would light him on his way, continued Mary, and his prayer was heard. By the clear light of the full moon, he ran after the toad, and he nearly caught her, when, what do you think happened? Oh, go on, sister, tell me quickly, said Harry excitedly. Why, the toad jumped right into the face of the moon, and, turning round to the wolf, said, How's that, Mr. Wolf? And she is laughing at the wolf to this day. That was a clever little toad, said Harry, laughing. 
and how vexed Mr. Wolf must have been. Are there any more people on the moon? I mean story people. Yes, there is one we read about in the legend of Hiawatha. Don't you remember how Nokomi tells about a warrior, who very angry seized his grandmother and threw her up into the sky at midnight, right against the moon he threw her. Tis her body that you see there. Do you think he meant the black marks you can see all over the moon, sister? Very likely, replied Mary. And perhaps you would like me to tell you what those black marks are. They are enormous plains and gloomy caverns on the moon. A long time ago, perhaps, these plains were bays and seas. At least, a great astronomer named Galileo thought they were, and he gave them such pretty names. The Sea of Serenity, the Bay of Dreams, the Ocean of Storms. But he lived in the days before it was known that there is not any water on the surface of the moon. Then the caverns on the moon may once have been volcanoes, pouring forth hot lava and ashes, just as the active volcanoes on the earth. But the volcanoes in the moon have gone out. They are now like huge dark caverns, some of them more than fifty miles across. One is three miles deep, and it is named Tycho, after a great astronomer of olden times. Then there are mountains on the moon just like the mountains on Earth, and quite as high. In walking over the moon, you would find it very rough and uneven, but you would not mind this very much, as you would weigh so much less. Just think, Harry. You would weigh only one-sixth as much as you do here. And what would Uncle Robert weigh? asked Harry, with a gleam of mischief in his eye. He would only weigh forty pounds, said Mary, laughing. And if he played football on the moon, a good kick would send the ball six times as far away as here. Supposing we were on the moon now, you could throw a stone at Uncle Robert's house on the other side of the grounds, six hundred yards away, and hit one of the windows. I expect Uncle Robert may be glad then we're not on the moon, said Harry, laughing, because I am afraid I should be throwing stones at the windows all the time. I can see the windows plainly from here. There is a light in the library. Then it must be very late, said Mary, looking over at the house, because Uncle said he would not be home till nine o'clock. So I can only tell you one more little story about the moon, and then I must let you go to sleep. This story is told by a Hindu people, and gives the reason why the moon shines with such a soft, silvery light. The Hindu Legend The sun, the moon and the wind had been invited to dinner one day by their uncle and aunt, thunder and lightning. Their mother, one of the most distant stars you see far up in the sky, waited patiently at home for the return of her children. Sad to relate, the sun and wind were both greedy and selfish, and while enjoying a good feast, forgot all about their poor, hungry mother at home. But the gentle moon did not forget, and whenever a dainty dish was placed before her, she would put part of it aside for the star who waited so patiently at home. When the sun, moon, and wind returned home, the star, who had kept her bright little eye open all night long, said, Dear children, have you brought anything home for me? Then the sun, who was the oldest, said, I have brought nothing home for you. I went out to enjoy myself with my friends, not to get a dinner for my mother. And the wind said, Neither have I brought home anything for you, mother. You could scarcely expect me to think of you when I merely went out for my own pleasure. But the gentle moon said, Mother, see all the good things I saved for you. And she placed a choice dinner before her mother. Then the star turned to the sun and said, Because you went out to amuse yourself with your friends, Without any thought of your poor, lonely mother at home, you shall be cursed. Henceforth your rays shall be ever hot and scorching. They shall burn all they touch, and men shall hate you and cover their heads when you appear. That is why the sun is so hot to this day. Then she turned to the wind and said, You also, who forgot your mother while you were enjoying yourself, shall be punished. You shall always blow during the hot, dry weather, and shall parch and shrivel all living things. Men shall detest and avoid you from this time till the end of the world. That is why the wind is so disagreeable during the hot weather. But to the gentle moon she said, Daughter, because you remembered your hungry mother at home, you shall be cool, calm, and bright. No dazzling glare will accompany your pure rays, 
and men will call you blessed. That is why the moon's light is so soothing and beautiful. Is that all? asked Harry, as his sister finished the story. That is all, said Mary. But here's a little good night lullaby by Eugene Field, and then you must go to sleep. In through the window a moonbeam comes, little gold moonbeam with misty wings. All silently creeping, he asks, are you sleeping? Sleeping and dreaming while the pretty stars sing. The New Moon by Mrs. Fallon Dear mother, how pretty the moon looks tonight. She was never so cunning before. Her two little horns are so sharp and bright. I hope she'll not grow any more. If I were up there, with you and my friends, I'd rock in it nicely, you'd see. I'd sit in the middle, and hold by both ends. Oh, what a bright cradle it would be. I would call to the stars to keep out of the way, lest we should rock over their toes. And then I would rock till the dawn of the day, and see where the pretty moon goes. And there we would stay in the beautiful skies, and through the bright crowds we would roam. We would see the sun set, and see the sun rise, and on the next rainbow come home. Taken from Child Life, edited by Whittier. Lady Moon, by Lord Horton. Lady Moon, Lady Moon, where are you roving? Over the sea. Lady Moon, Lady Moon, whom are you loving? All that love me. Are you not tired with rolling and never resting to sleep? Why look so pale and so sad, as forever wishing to weep? Ask me not this, little child, if you love me. You are too bold. I must obey my dear father above me, and do as I'm told. Lady Moon, Lady Moon, where are you roving? Over the sea. Lady Moon, Lady Moon, whom are you loving? All that love me. Taken from Child Life, edited by Whittier. A Legend A moonbeam once fell on the bell of a flower, way down by a silvery rill. Twas cradled to sleep in a rapturous hour, when all the green forest was still. That flower, when golden and glad was the morning, was shriveled and wilted and thin. But on the next night, all its chalice adorning, the moonbeam still lingered within. Since then has the flower been tender and creamy, wherever its petals have blown. All fragile and pearly, and dainty and dreamy, is the night-blooming serious known. Taken from the New York Tribune. End of section 3《Section Four of Stories of Starland》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Stories of Starland by Mary Proctor — The Planet Mars and the Baby Planets Next morning Harry and his little cousin Nellie, with her doll, awaited Mary. Harry had told Nellie about his delightful ramble on the moon the evening before and she was delighted with the stories of the man the woman and the toad in the moon i wonder what cousin mary will tell us about this morning she said i am going to tell you about a pretty little planet named mars said mary as she came into the room and overheard nelly's remark picking up nelly and placing her on her knee she began the story of mars as follows story of planet mars next door to our own planet earth is a beautiful little world tinted with red it has snow-white caps at the north and south poles just like our earth and trees and flowers perhaps far prettier for we all know but there is not much water on mars because mars is an old planet how do you know it is old asked harry i know it is old replied his sister because the older a planet is the smaller are the seas and lakes and the amount of water on its surface as the planet gets older and older the water disappears until not a drop is left but there are wonderful canals all over mars and if there were boats up there you could go all over mars by means of these canals when mr lowell looked at mars through his fine telescope he not only saw the canals but round spots where the canals meet 
perhaps the spots are landing-places where the captains take new passengers aboard said harry earnestly perhaps harry said his sister laughing that is if there are any people on mars and captains and boats how you would enjoy going in a yacht up and down these canals seeing the lovely flowers and scenery on mars for i am sure it must be a very beautiful little world it is not quite as bright on mars as it is here since it is farther away from the sun and only gets one half as much light and heat the year is also nearly twice as long and lasts six hundred and eighty-seven days instead of only three hundred and sixty-five therefore the summer season is nearly twice as long but not nearly as warm as here then the winter must be twice as long and much colder than here harry said i do not think i should like that but perhaps the canals freeze over in the winter time and there may be fine skating up there no the canals disappear altogether during the winter time replied mary or rather we cannot see them until they reappear again as faint dark lines in the springtime they get wider and wider until the summer season then they get narrow again and disappear some of them are double but the double lines we see may mean only grass and ferns on each side of a large canal fifty miles wide when the canals double the little round spots at the junctions of the canals darken perhaps these spots are like little islands in a desert and they are covered with grass during the summer time i should like to live on one of those little islands said harry wouldn't you nelly if i could take my dolly with me she replied as she gazed at it tenderly and we might go for little boat rides all around the islands do you think there are any little girls on mars who have beautiful dollies like mine i really do not know replied mary but if there are any people living on mars i do know they are not like us we could not live there as there is not enough air for us to breathe we would gasp just as that poor fish did the other day when uncle robert hauled it up out of the lake and threw it into the boat we must have air and plenty of it if we want to live so we could not live on mars could we sister said harry it would not be comfortable replied mary besides it is not nearly as warm as here poor uncle robert would nearly freeze during the long winter he would also find another surprise awaiting him if he went to mars mars is a smaller world than the earth so everything weighs less ah i see said harry clapping his hands with glee uncle would not be so heavy on mars how glad he would be to go there poor uncle robert he is so heavy he just shakes the house when he walks across the floor next time i see him i shall say go to mars uncle robert and see what will happen to you there how much would he weigh on mars he weighs two hundred and forty pounds here and would weigh only ninety pounds there and you would weigh only thirty pounds so i could pick you up couch and all and carry you as easily as nelly carries her doll in its carriage then dolly would weigh nothing at all said nelly looking at her doll curiously harry looked puzzled and after thinking a moment he said to his sister i cannot see why i would weigh less if i went to mars because the planet being smaller than the earth it has less power to attract you and to hold you down to its surface the earth is like a great magnet and if there were not something drawing us to it and keeping us there we would be greatly puzzled tables and chairs would not stand firm and we would stagger about for want of weight just as when a diver tries to walk in deep water he has to have heavy weights fastened to him so as to keep him in place a stone that would be quite heavy on earth would weigh only a few ounces on mars nelly could carry this large rocking chair i am sitting in and eight or ten dollies as well do you remember seeing the men at the circus jumping over bars five feet high well on mars they could jump fifteen feet while the clumsy old elephant we saw there would probably be as graceful and nimble as a deer how would football be on mars asked harry very unlike football here dear a good kick would send the ball much farther than here is mars very far away asked nelly if we could go there in a train would it take us ever so long going about sixty years said mary laughing if the train went a mile a minute if you tried to walk it 
going four miles an hour and ten hours a day it would take you more than two thousand years to get there so i don't think we can take that trip little girl can we but let us call on the next door neighbor or neighbors to mars for there are about four hundred and fifty of them story of the baby planets four hundred and fifty little worlds asked harry where can there be room for them all and don't they knock against each other in the sky no there is plenty of room for them up there besides they are so small some of them being only ten miles wide why uncle robert walked ten miles the other day said harry he could walk all around those little worlds and if they are so little i suppose he would weigh scarcely anything at all if he lived on one of them i should think he would be almost like the giant with the seven league boots don't you remember nelly you were reading about him the other day poor little jack and the giant killer would not have much chance there but perhaps he could fly if he weighed so little and how would football be on these little worlds you might give the ball such a kick that it would leave the planet altogether and circle around the sun as a planet on its own how harry and nelly laughed at the idea of a football circling around the sun as a planet and is this really true inquired harry why this is better than any fairy story i ever heard now tell me some more don't you think we might be able to fly on these tiny worlds if you could get someone to make you a pair of wings up there it would be quite easy to fly our bodies would only weigh a few pounds so we ought to be able to flap a pair of wings strong enough to keep us flying that is if the air around these little worlds is as dense as ours don't i wish i lived there then said harry regretfully because it would not matter about my being lame and i could put on my wings whenever i wanted to see you nelly and fly across the park and way way up high into the sky and oh don't harry said nelly throwing her doll on the ground and catching hold of her cousin in dismay if you go you must take me with you too and poor little dolly she continued suddenly remembering her precious charge and cousin mary and uncle robert and aunt agnes and everybody in the world what would we do if you flew away from us but i can't said harry laughing at her dismay and it's just like a little girl to think i would go and leave her all alone no we'll all go some day won't we he continued turning to his sister mary and we'll be with the angels and have wings you and nelly and i why we will all fly and i shall forget i ever was lame on planet earth then and will father have wings too asked nelly curiously he will want a very big pair something like the big eagles down at the aquarium will he you little rogue exclaimed the loud good-natured voice of her father as he appeared on the scene so this is where you are and i've been looking for you all over the house and grounds i told nurse i would be back in a minute she replied a minute said her father laughing heartily why you have been here nearly an hour so you want your father to have wings do you you little rogue wait till i show you how you would fly if you had wings the next morning he put her up on his shoulder dolly and all and ran with her across the meadow at full speed while she laughed merrily and clapped her hands with delight so the party is broken up said harry's nurse who came to look after her charge yes one of the audience has flown said harry laughing and i must fly too said mary as she kissed harry lovingly and i shall tell you about the rest of giant sun's family to-morrow good-bye end of section four section five of stories of starland this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. stories of starland by mary proctor story of jupiter and his moons it was several days before mary could see harry again and tell him sky stories as he called them for he had been suffering much pain even her gentle voice irritated him and perfect quiet was ordered by the doctor until the little sufferer was better 
at last he was able to enjoy the sunlight and the flowers and the song of the birds again and one bright morning he was all ready as he told his sister to take another trip to starland as mary arranged the pillows on the couch for him and a large sunshade so that the glare of sunlight would not hurt his eyes he caught hold of her hand and pressing it lovingly he said darling what should i do without you you are so good to me how can i help it little sweetheart said mary as she turned her head aside to keep him from seeing the tears that would come to her eyes how can i help it when i love you so dearly besides you are my own dear little brother and you don't know how i missed you all last week did you really sister and i was dreaming away all day long about the wonderful stories you have been telling me i played football on mars and had beautiful wings when i lived on the baby planets and flew from one to another and now i want to know something about the giant planets you said they live next door to the little tiny planets story of jupiter yes next door to the baby planets we come to the largest of all the giant planet jupiter if a tunnel were made through the centre of jupiter eleven globes as large as the earth placed side by side would reach from one side to the other you could make thirteen hundred globes out of planet jupiter as large as the earth if the earth were a large snowball and a giant could roll thirteen hundred such snowballs into one he would have a ball to play with as large as planet jupiter if it were made of the same material as the earth it would be more than three hundred times as heavy it would take a very big giant to play with that snowball wouldn't it said harry smiling at the thought there would not be much room in the sky for him to play in would there plenty of room replied his sister laughing room for millions and millions of balls as large as jupiter and much much larger what a wonderful place the sky must be said harry in awe now tell me more about jupiter didn't you tell me last week that he is hidden away among blankets and very very hot that is right harry but some day he will cool down and the blankets will change into beautiful oceans and seas and lakes then it will be a world like ours with trees and flowers and perhaps people will live there the sun is so much further away from jupiter than from the earth that it gives it only one twenty-seventh as much light and heat if you can imagine the sun is a bright lamp in the sky and someone turning down the wick of the lamp till its light is only one twenty-seventh as bright as it is now you can imagine how dim the light and small the amount of heat must be on jupiter how long does jupiter take in going round the sun asked harry about twelve years replied mary and the day is only about ten hours long instead of twenty-four as here what a short day said harry in surprise then you could work only five hours and sleep five hours i believe i would sleep all day and all night too i must tell nelly about that next time i see her why did she not come this morning i wonder said mary perhaps she has gone for a walk with her nurse i'll tell her about my trip said harry generously when she comes over here again and now what else is there about jupiter jupiter is seen through a telescope if you look at it through a large telescope you will see that it is beautifully colored as if uncle robert had taken his paint box and dipped his brush into browns and reds and tinted the cloud belts around jupiter here and there with touches of yellow and orange olive green and purple only an artist could get such beautiful effects if we could journey to one of the little moons of jupiter has jupiter moons also asked harry delighted at the thought five of them said mary and i shall tell you about them later supposing we could journey to one of these little moons what a glorious sight jupiter would be from the nearest moon it would look thousands of times larger than our moon the colors we see only faintly through our telescopes would present a magnificent sight when seen at close range while constant changes would be taking place as varied as the changes in the clouds flitting across the summer sky 
great cloud masses drift hither and thither with enormous speed driven by winds of hurricane force by watching the changes that take place in the clouds we know there must be winds blowing at the rate of nearly two hundred miles per hour do you remember the cyclone uncle robert told us about when several houses were blown down and trees uprooted yes indeed i do replied harry and his poor little dog fido was nearly killed by a falling chimney poor little fido would not have much chance on jupiter the storms there are ever so much worse than here the strongest buildings would be blown down in a few moments sturdy oaks would be uprooted and blown about by the wind like straws do the storms last very long asked harry they last six and seven weeks at a time replied mary so that jupiter would scarcely be a comfortable world to live on yet besides it is still in the fiery stage won't you tell me some more about the little moons of jupiter asked harry the moons of jupiter they are not so little after all brother except the first one which is only one hundred miles wide it is such a shy little moon that it keeps hiding behind jupiter or get so close to him that it is lost in the glare of light from the giant planet we had no idea it was there at all until an american astronomer professor barnard caught sight of it one evening it was playing hide-and-seek as usual but professor barnard with his keen eyes spied the little speck of light it is now known as the fifth moon of jupiter it was only discovered in eighteen ninety two and just think that for hundreds and hundreds of years it has been there yet no one had seen it the french people were so delighted because professor barnard caught sight of the little truant that they gave him a beautiful gold medal won't you show the little moon to me some time said harry i should like to see it so much you can only see it through a very large telescope but i can show you the other four moons if uncle robert will lend us his telescope here he comes said harry in great glee as he saw uncle robert crossing the meadow won't you bring over your telescope this evening said harry pleadingly as he told him what mary had just said certainly my little man his uncle replied but we can only see three of the moons this evening as one of them is eclipsed what's that said harry in surprise at the strange word eclipsed means hidden said mary laughing if uncle robert stands right in front of you as he is doing just now he hides me from you so i am eclipsed very true said uncle robert laughing heartily at the hint planet mary is eclipsed by uncle robert and poor little planet harry cannot see her till uncle robert gets out of the way this he immediately proceeded to do and next moment he was pursuing fido who was having a not over friendly encounter with a strange cat in a neighbor's garden oh dear said harry in distress where were we we were up in the sky among the planets and now uncle robert has brought us back again to earth do listen to poor fido he certainly seemed to be getting the worst of the encounter with pussy but when uncle robert came to the rescue the enemy vanished and fido nothing daunted went in search of other prey when peace and quiet were once more restored mary resumed her story eclipse of jupiter's moons do you know the appearance and disappearance of the little moons of jupiter once gave a great deal of trouble to astronomers they had a way of appearing a little too soon or a little too late they were very seldom on time this was very provoking as astronomers were rather proud of being able to tell exactly when these little moons could be seen at last they found out what was the matter and that they were to blame and not the moons we see the little moons on account of their light and light takes time to travel don't you remember i told you sound travels a mile in five seconds light travels more quickly for it only takes a little over a second in coming to us from the moon it takes about eight minutes in coming to us from the sun but jupiter is about five times as far away from us as the sun so that light takes about half an hour in coming to us from jupiter we do not see it as it is but as it was more than half an hour ago when its rays of light started out to planet earth now jupiter in going around the sun 
is sometimes on the same side of the sun as we are then the light from the moons reaches us in about thirty-two minutes but when jupiter is on the opposite side of the sun and as far away from us as it can be then light takes as much as forty-eight minutes in coming here over a quarter of an hour longer so a clever astronomer decided that when jupiter and his moons are nearest to us it does not take as long for their light to reach us as when they are farther away and this is because light like sound must have time to travel even though light can go round the earth seven times in a second travelling at the rate of about a hundred and eighty six thousand miles a second yet as jupiter is millions of miles away it takes light about half an hour and sometimes forty-eight minutes for it to cross that great distance it is just the same as if uncle robert were in india it would take him a much longer time to come and see you than if he were at his home just a few hundred yards away it takes time for him to travel here just as it takes time for light to travel from the little moons of jupiter i wish we had five moons shining on our earth said harry how pretty it would be does it take the moons as long as our moon to get around jupiter they are much livelier than our moon replied mary and the second moon flies right around jupiter in a little more than a day and a half and even the outside moon only takes about two weeks so there must always be a moon shining in the sky for jupiter these moons except the moon discovered by professor bernard are all larger than our moon and the fourth one is nearly as large as mars but i hear the bell for lunch harry and i must run away now i will tell you about the other planets later how many are there said harry as his sister kissed him good-bye only three replied mary and i shall tell you about them to-morrow if you are not too tired too tired said harry i am never too tired to listen to you jupiter oh that it were my doom to be the spirit of yon beauteous star dwelling up there in purity alone as all such bright things are my soul employ to pray and shine to light my censer at the sun more loves of the angels a lesson in astronomy the solar system puzzled us miss mary said she thought it would and so she gave us each a name and made it all into a game and then we understood teresa with her golden hair all loose and shining was the sun and round her mercury and mars venus and all the other stars stood waiting every one i was the earth with little nell beside me for the moon so round and saturn had two hoops for rings and mercury a pair of wings and jupiter was crowned then when miss mary waved her hand each slow and stately in our place we circled round the sun until a comet that was little will came rushing on through space he darted straight into our midst he whirled among us like a flash the stars went flying and the sun and laughing breathless wild with fun the system went to smash youth's companion end of section five section six of stories of starland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by pinchcliffe stories of starland by mary proctor section six the giant planets the planet saturn harry had spent a most delightful evening looking through uncle robert's telescope at the little moons of jupiter and he also had seen the planet saturn with its rings and moons next evening when his sister came to talk with him he had many questions to ask her first of all he wanted to know what the rings were made of millions of little moons replied his sister i wish you could see saturn and its rings through the great telescope at the lick observatory it makes such a pretty picture like jupiter the planet saturn is surrounded by clouds but they are tinted with blue at the poles and yellow elsewhere and dotted here and there with brown purple and red spots around the centre is a creamy white belt then 
there are eight moons that accompany Saturn in its journey around the sun, but they give very little light to the planet, since if they could all be full together, they would give but a sixteenth part of the light we receive from the moon. Why is that? asked Harry. The planet Uranus. Because Saturn is so far away from the sun, replied Mary. Next to Saturn we find Uranus. This planet was first seen by William Herschel, who afterwards became one of the greatest astronomers the world has ever known. When Herschel was a little boy, his home was in Hanover. He had great talent for music, and when he was 14 years old, he joined the band of the Hanoverian Guards. What a proud boy he was when he dressed in his uniform. However, pride must have a fall, and it was not a very long before he wished he had never entered the army. Just about this time, war broke out between France and England, and as Hanover belonged to the English, it was attacked by the French. The Hanoverian guards were badly defeated. Herschel spent the night after the battle hiding away in a ditch, and the next day, assisted by his friends, he ran away to England. And there he continued his musical studies, and some years later he became a fine organist. Did he have to play a big organ like the one in our church? asked Harry. Something like that, I suppose, said Mary and he played very well indeed. He learned more and more about music, and in the evenings, when going and coming from the church, he used to notice the beautiful stars overhead, and he wished he could learn something about them. Just the way I feel, said Harry. I get nurse to pull up the window curtain at night so that I can see the stars from my bed, and they seem to laugh and wink their little eyes at me as if they knew I was watching them. Did Herschel have a telescope like the one Uncle Robert has? He was not so fortunate, but he wanted one very much indeed. So he borrowed a telescope from a friend, and every night after practicing in the church, he would amuse himself looking at the stars. He longed to have a telescope of his own, but he found that they cost more than he could afford to pay, so he decided to make one. He bought all that was necessary, and turned his home for the time into a workshop. He had a dear, good-natured sister named Caroline, and she did all she could to help her brother. Sometimes he was too busy to eat, and she used to feed him. When he was tired, she would read to him from the Arabian Nights. The same book I have? asked Harry in surprise. The very same, and this helped to pass away the time while Herschel polished away on the great mirror of his telescope. When the telescope was finished, people came from far and near to see it. One evening, when Herschel was gazing at the stars with this magic glass, he spied a star not marked down on his charts. Something wrong here, thought Herschel. This must be a comet. But after noticing it for a while, he found that it was not a comet, but a planet or wanderer among the stars. Difference between planet and a star. How could he tell the difference? asked Harry. When I looked at planet Jupiter last night, it looked like the stars, only rounder and bigger. The planets are so much nearer to us than the stars that we can follow them as they slowly creep between us and the stars in their journey around the sun. The stars are so far away that we would have to watch them for thousands of years before they would seem to move at all, yet we know they're moving. Are the stars moving? said Harry in surprise. Yes, they are moving just as distant steamers seen at sea are moving, but they're so far away that they can seem motionless. Don't you remember how we used to watch them from the seashore? Still, they were going as fast as steam could take them. We might compare the steamers to the stars, and the little boats nearer the shore were more like the planets. We could easily follow the boats with our eyes as they danced over the waves, and in the same way, we can easily follow the planets as they creep across the sky, because they are so much nearer to us than the stars. The new planet was called Uranus, although at first the friends of Herschel wanted to name it after him. Next to Uranus comes the planet Neptune, which was discovered before it was even seen. The discovery of planet Neptune. How could that happen? asked Harry. Because Uranus behaved so strangely, replied his sister. The planets attract each other. For instance, 
the Earth is swayed to and fro by Jupiter and Venus, and a great struggle is going on among the planets in the family of the giant sun. It could be plainly seen that Saturn was taking part in the struggle and dragging Uranus toward it, but something beyond the newly discovered planet was pulling in the other way. There must be another planet, said the astronomers, and they were right. After puzzling over the problem, two astronomers found the truant and announced exactly when and where it was to be seen. And there it was, nearly exactly where these learned men said it would be. The new planet was christened Neptune, and it takes about 164 years to go around the sun. It is so far away from the sun that it only receives one nine hundredth of the amount of light and heat that we receive on planet Earth. Then it must be very cold on planet Neptune, said Harry. And very dark also, said Mary, since from this planet the sun only looks as large as an electric light seen at a distance of a few feet. Is it true? By Morgan Groth. She stood where the winter sunlight seemed opening into the skies. She was only a little girl, you see, and a teacher was old and wise. You never can be promoted, that wise, wise teacher said, for the lesson you need the most of all, you leave unlearned, little maid. I didn't like to say it. Her answer was grave and slow, that the earth goes whirling round like a ball, for I don't see how they know. I'll write it down on my paper, the one that I hand to you, but when I die, I shall find the Lord, and ask him if it's true. The classes were called without her, and the school days come and go, and the other children wander and wait. Is it hers alone to know? Sometimes in the empty schoolroom, the teacher is left alone, with the echoes that linger about the place, and call from stone to stone. And lo, with this world's learning, before his wandering view, he goes to his Lord, his all-wise Lord, and asks him if it's true. From Child Study Monthly End of Section 6librivox.org recording by pinchcliffe stories of starland by mary proctor section 7 comments and meteors a few minutes later mary had a wonderful story to tell her brother about some visitors from space who often visit the kingdom of giant sun they're called comets or hairy stars but i rather enjoy calling them celestial tramps what are they like asked Harry. They usually have bright golden head, sometimes as large as the earth, and as they approach the sun, they adorn themselves with glittering train, millions of miles in length. Some of the comets are regular visitors, and we know just when to expect them. Others come, and do not return for hundreds of years, while a few visit the sun, never to return again. Where do they come from? asked Harry. We scarcely know, replied Mary except that it's from outer space, just like tramps on Earth. We do not know where tramps come from, nor do we expect to see them again. If they do revisit us, however, we can usually recognise them. Do you remember the old man who came to the kitchen door the other day and begged for food? You felt so sorry for him. You would know him if you saw him again, on account of his long white beard, white hair and shabby clothes? When a celestial tramp returns, however, it is not so easy to recognise it. When it first greeted us, it may have had a large head and a gorgeous train millions of miles in length. Next time we see it, how it has changed! Its head may be small, its train may have vanished, or it may be the proud owner of three or four trains. A comet usually changes its appearance every visit. Just as if the old man we saw the other day were to cut off his head, dye his hair black, and wear Uncle Robert's dress suit. We should not know him, should we, Harry? I should think not, said Harry, laughing at the very idea. Then how can you tell when the same comet visits us again? Because it has a regular path marked out for it in the sky, 
replied Mary. It travels along that path unless something happens to it on the way. It may go too near giant planet Jupiter, just like our tramp again. Let us suppose that it has a regular path marked out and it takes him across Uncle Robert's farm and leads to our kitchen door. We may expect to see Mr. Tramp tomorrow. As he crosses the farm, a dog bites him and frightens him away. Perhaps then we may not see him again. Poor old man, laughed Harry. I hope that won't happen to him. Do the celestial tramps travel very quickly through the sky? Not very quickly, until they come close to the sun. Then they rush around it ever so much faster than an express train. But as they recede from the sun, they go more slowly until they seem only to creep along, as if worn out by their long journey. They also lose their trains after they go away from the sun, and the train becomes shorter and shorter, till the comet looks like a round, buffy ball, just as it did before it came too close to the sun. It is the sun's heat that drives the particles from the head of the comet and forms a train. What are comets made of? asked Harry. Of millions of tiny particles covered with coats of glowing gas. These particles are made up of carbon, sodium, iron and magnesium. You will find plenty of sodium in the sea, while common table salt is partly sodium. You know what magnesium is. Some of that medicine the doctor gives you is made of it. So if I get some iron and salt and coal and some of my medicine, I can put them all together. I should have a bit of a comet, said Harry. But you must remember, the coal, iron, and sodium, and magnesium must be very much heated, and don't forget the coat of gas. Sometimes a comet breaks into pieces, and the fragments travel along by themselves as meteors. Sometimes the Earth plunges through swarms of meteors, which journey in regular paths around the sun. At such a time, the bright masses seem to fall in showers from the sky. There are three great showers, which we always know when to expect. Some come in August, some on the 13th or 14th of November, and there is another shower which always appears within a day or two of the 27th of November. If you November stars would see, from 12th to 14th watching be. In August too, stars shine from heaven, on nights between 9 and 11. Story of Meteors What are meteors? asked Harry. Meteors are great masses of stone or iron, which sometimes weigh several tons. Lieutenant Perry found one not long ago in the Arctic regions, and it weighed about 80 tons. It is lucky for us that many meteors do not fall onto the earth, or we should have to walk about with iron umbrellas over our heads as a precaution. When they do fall to earth, they are much prized and placed in our museums as curiosities. A story is told about a meteor that fell on a farm some time ago. The landlord said it belonged to him, for when he rented the farm to the tenant, he claimed all mineral and metals found in the ground. But it was not on the farm when the lease was made out, said the tenant. Then I claim it as flying game, replied the landlord angrily. But it has neither wings nor feathers, so I lay claim to it as ground game, said the tenant in reply. While the dispute was going on, the customs officers seized the meteorite. As they said, it had come into the country without paying duty. That is not a true story, is it? asked Harry, laughing. Scarcely, replied Mary, but it was a good joke on the landlord. And now we come to the very smallest members of the family of Giant Sun. I mean, the shooting stars. Those bright little flying stars we can see at night? asked Harry. Story of a shooting star. Yes, replied Mary. And if they could only talk, what a wonderful story they would have to tell. A shooting star is very much smaller than a meteor, and the largest does not weigh more than a quarter of an ounce. You could easily hold one in your hand, for it is like a stone. Only, unlike a stone, it is always on the move. It hurries along through space ever so much faster than an express train, and all goes well, as long as it keeps above the blanket of air that surrounds the earth. If it comes too near, however, it is sure to be destroyed. It dashes into the air at the rate of 25 miles a second, rubbing against every particle it meets on its way. This makes it intensely hot, until it glows with brilliant light. We see it for a few moments, as it flashes out against the dark sky, but the light soon fades, 
and all that remains of the shooting star is its ashes. Sometimes they sift down upon the earth and settle on the tops of high mountains, or sink into the ocean, or float in through an open window and rest upon tables and books as fine as dust. But when our good housekeeper finds it there, she carefully removes it with her duster. She does not know nor care where it came from. It certainly has no right there, and she treats it with small ceremony. I wonder what she would say if she knew that the dust had come from the sky, said Harry. I do not think it would make any difference, said Mary, laughing. And now I'm going to tell you a little story about a shooting star, and then I must say good night. It is said that the evil genie, you remember reading about them in Arabian Nights, don't you, Harry? Indeed I do, he replied. Well, at night they're said to fly up to the gates of heaven and listen to the conversations of angels. When the angels see their hidden foes, they hurl fiery shooting stars at them, and with so good an aim, that for every shooting star we may be sure there is one spirit of evil left in the world. Starlight at Sea Overhead the countless stars, like eyes of love were beaming, beneath the weary earth all breathless lay a-dreaming. The twilight hours like birds flew by, as lightly and as free, ten thousand stars were in the sky, ten thousand in the sea. For every wave with dimpled face, that leaped upon the air, had caught a star in its embrace, and held it trembling there. Amelia B. Welby End of section 7